uh, by then he, he knew it was, why let these people just be slaughtered, let's take our chance. And so. You surrendered then? Surrendered then. Okay. Mm -hmm. and that, uh, How was, uh, what's going through your mind at this point now that, uh, I mean, it seems like, it's, well, pretty much like anything, I'm sure it's the unknown, well, but. Uh, I think most of us figured they were going to do us in as we surrendered, we felt that. We were kind of surprised they weren't. And I often wondered if it had been just the common soldier, they might have. But that SS group, you know, it's, it's kind of like a professional club. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was. Then we were so tired it didn't matter. That was, that was the whole thing. We were all so tired we, we, we didn't. And I think that's how I felt. I don't care. I don't care. Because I really thought I made my peace. And, because I thought the next one coming in, it's, it's it. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, how many of you were left and how many were taken prisoner, roughly? You know, I could I could have gone, and I was going to do that after that thing in Loveland, because as I recall, we started out with some 320 men, plus the tanks, which is more. And I think about 35 or 40 of us were left after that time. They A lot had been wounded and taken back during that day. Wow. But, uh, but uh, so that was that's scary. Wow. wow. And where did they take you once they you were They took us across the Rhine, and I remember very vividly. I was so thirsty. You know, I said I don't remember being hungry, mm -hmm. but thirsty all the time. And I don't know what was in that Rhine. All kinds of stuff by then, but I know the that water out of the helmet, just drinking the water straight out of the Rhine. It tasted pretty good. Wow. <laughs> the, wow. Then they, we walked through a place called Baden Baden, which is a, a great resort place now. Mm -hmm. And that was our first interrogation there. That's when I learned how, what my name meant. He said, the interrogator said, You're German. I said, No, I'm not German. He said, Well, your name is Funke? And I said, Yeah. He said, Well, that's German. I said, Well, that's it. <laughs> That's, then they tried to scare us. I don't know. My best friend, I could see, walked by the window. He saw me in there. He says, "See you, Funky," and they were taking him someplace. And it was shortly after that. He it was not shortly after that. We heard a machine gun go. Ooh. And I think they were trying to scare oh, us. Oh right. And they didn't do anything because he lived later. He lived in Ely, Minnesota. And then, you know, I can't recall how far we walked. They put us on a train and we went to. Uh, Ludwig's, Ludwig's Haven, Ludwig's Haven, near Stuttgart. And we were there for a time, it was an old stable kind of a thing. Then we were put on a train again and we were sent to North Germany, near Bremen. And I think it was either four days and three nights or three days and four nights in that boxcar, which was so crowded we could not all sit down at one time. It was impossible to lie down because had so many. You had to take turns sitting, and that was uh, that was pretty gross. <laughs> Did they provide uh, food or water during that time? They, as I recall, once a day they they shoved something through the little window. There was just two little windows, the mm -hmm. one on mm -hmm. opposite corners of the car. Uh, they must have provided water some way, but I don't recall that. I remember the bucket in the corner. And if they had ever stopped, somebody would hand them the bucket, you know. But that was it. Wow. <laughs> to, wow. So then we got to Fallen Basel, which was Tallog 11B, which I read just recently in a, in a history. And it was partly a German history book. They claimed that that particular camp was, was considered to be the worst in Germany. Really? Partly, I think, because we had all the we had Americans in there. We didn't have any airmen because those were all kept in a separate camp. And but there were Russians and Mongols and Serbs and Indians and everything yeah. else. Were you mingled together? Or were you kept separate? No, we yeah. were kept separate. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> we were kept separate. But a friend of mine and I found a way because a man came up to us and started talking to us. A Russian and the Russian compound was right next to us. And so we found a way we could squeeze under the, nobody was looking, we'd squeeze under the fence and then go into the compound and talk with him. Really? Oh, wow. 
<laughs> and it's very interesting. There's a Russian engineer, a young man, Russian engineer. Well, he could have been too young, because he had told us that he had been one of the engineers on the big, deeper river dams in Russia. And uh, he didn't talk about his family. He just talked about his himself and about his country. And when we saw that the war was coming, well, ending, you know, and uh, like I mentioned, all those B-17s going unopposed both directions, you knew it was a little over. And that was your indication? I mean, Yeah, would, we, we knew. We knew. And oh, they okay. had no air support. They had no way of stopping those 17s going back and forth. So we're talking, day. we're talking late winter, spring of 45 then? April. April, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we were talking to this man, and uh, I think I said, well, I'm sure you'll be anxious to get out and you can go to your homeland. And he said, no, I can't, I can't go home. He said, I'll be killed immediately. And I said, well, why would you be killed? I mean, you're an engineer, you did this. He says, I know too much. So I never thought about it until we went back later one time and he said, you know, now this is 45. Mm -hmm. He said, your country will be fighting my country in some way in five years. Wow. When did the Korean War yeah, start? Yeah, 50. Yeah. Five years. Yeah. yeah. Thought, Whoa. Maybe he didn't know too much. You know. We never saw him when we were liberated, but I'm sure he ran west. I'm sure he didn't go east. I'm sure he ran west. But I've thought about this man periodically since 1945, where he went, or how he got, or did he get to America, or what did he do? You know. Ah, uh, wow. But uh, wow. yeah, my my political thing was changed after talking with him. I'll be done. Wow. That, uh, but the liberation was exciting. Well, uh, before we get to that, mm -hmm. you, you talked about it being described as one of the worst camps. Yeah. Talk about the conditions in the camp. Well, we were in kind of a big flat one floor. The only heat was one wood stove in the middle, and it didn't heat. There was a cold winter. Uh, as far as sleeping, they had tiers of bunks, and the bunks are about three feet wide, and two men slept. Two. Yes. And so when you had to turn over, you'd wrap the guy on the shoulder, sit, shift, and so you could turn over. There was nothing on them, just the boards. One end of them was inclined like a pillow, so you had given up, and you'd put a jacket or something, if you would, but usually you needed the clothes over you. But the body heat, I suppose, kept you going. The food we were fed once a day was a little bowl of soup and a little piece of black bread about two by two. It's strange how long you can eat, eat on a piece of bread that's two inches cubed. <laughs> I once had the uh, recipe that they found in that German area, how they made that, and I think it was about 30 percent sawdust. Oh, geez. <laughs> and the soup was rutabaga soup. And I imagine that got worse and worse and worse towards the end when they were starting to run out of... They were, they were running out, I know. But the strange thing was there was an SS barracks not close, or not far. And as soon as it, we were liberated, we had been told, don't get out and mess around, you'll get in our way, you know, we don't have any equipment for you, just because we'll get you out of here in three days, which they did. Uh, but it was time enough to get to those... Uh, German barracks, they found a lot of oatmeal. So those guys just scooped up oatmeal and brought it back and had little fires and made oatmeal. Hmm. And, uh, uh, but the, and again, the sanitation. It was just an open pit latrine and a wire between and the, and the Russians and whoever, it was, I suppose it was about as wide as this room and just a little trickle of water running down below, and, uh, and the group sitting over the log on that side, group sitting over the log. We never understood where the women in the Russian compound came from. Then they would be there too. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And you can imagine the odors, and it was just... So there was no sanitation whatsoever. We had one shower, as I recall, in the three and a half months. and. Uh, so, but you know, at that time we didn't know really about the Holocaust and about the, the P 
people being told they were going to take a shower. In the, oh, you know, right, yeah, yeah, right. Had we known, we probably wouldn't have been too excited yeah. about that first yeah. shower. Yeah, right, right. But uh, there was one shower, and we, we slept in our clothes. We never took them off, you know. And, and in, in those conditions, you never succumbed to any of the diseases that uh, brought on with those kind of conditions? Some of the guys had a lot of dysentery and things. I never, never did, really. I had a louse bite that infected that went up my leg, but uh, that disappeared. And uh, I think a German doctor gave me some ointment or something just to put on the bite. And that did it. But uh, it seemed like the big men suffered more than a little hmm. because they burned up their own fat. I was a little and skinny. I didn't have any to burn. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I didn't need as much to go on. Gotcha. Okay. As I did. So they were they fared better. And were you receiving uh, Red Cross packages or anything like that? I think we got one that I recall, and that was good. If you didn't smoke, you could trade cigarettes for chocolate bar mm -hmm. or whatever. But I only recall one Red Cross box. Hmm. But, uh, so. Hmm. And I imagine uh, your folks probably got the telegram that you'd been missing in action or taken prisoner, or how did... Uh, yeah, I still got it laying around. Is that right? Yeah. And the one that says that I've been returned to military. Well, they didn't call it liberations, they said return to, to military, military control. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, but they didn't know that. It was from January till almost April. Well, it was January till late April when they got the... So, oh, I can't imagine what must have been going through their minds. Uh, well, it went through a lot of people's minds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. yeah. Well, getting back to uh, to the camp, uh, what would you guys do to pass time the, those three months? Somebody was able to get some. The British somehow got some magazines, I remember, into our compound one time that we uh, would use, read. And uh, there were three British men who were in show business of some kind, and they would come around and entertain us and sing to us, you know. So oh, wow. Uh, kind of funny. Uh -huh. But uh, we just mainly sit around and talk. Was there any? plans or talks of trying to escape, uh, as you see in the movies, or, uh... Well, you know, one time they dropped in leaflets and said, stay where you are. Uh, because, again, you know, it would just get in the way of anybody trying to do something yeah. and you'd probably be hurt. And, uh, and that usually came when they started dropping these um, metal foil things to the radar mm -hmm. or something, you mm -hmm. know, and they would drop in leaflets. So we're not far behind. It's coming. So don't get in our way. Just stay there. Hang on. And I think that stopped a lot of them. Now some of the other camps, I understand they did, but uh, but I know didn't know of anybody who, at least in our compound, that did. Yeah, yeah. And how do you feel about your? Uh uh, your captors, did, did they, you think you were treated fairly? Uh, any animosity towards your treatment or the, of them then and, and now as, as you look back Again, on it? I think it's probably because of the SS, you know. They were almost professional soldiers. Uh, and at that time they knew the end was near. And that's what I was, and I understand that the men who were in long before we were had more problems oh, really? than we did, but, but they, they could see the end coming. And uh, when it was really close and the guards disappeared and the, and the camp commander, who was really reminded me of Colonel Klink. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I look back at him and this was a Colonel Klink. For those that are watching, he, yeah, Colonel he, Klink was on the TV uh, comedy series, yeah, Hogan's Heroes. Hogan's Heroes. Okay. Yeah. Well, the camps were nothing like Hogan's yeah, Heroes. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, he called a camp meeting, you know, and uh, said he, he had to leave us now. And actually wished us well. Is that right? And then he disappeared. I don't know where he went. I think he probably went west also. Really? Because I don't think any of them wanted to go east. <laughs> but, uh, now, being up north, were you liber liberated by the British or? British. Amer British okay. 8th Army. Okay. 
and it was kind of like they had uh, scored it in Hollywood. I mean, we knew they were coming, and the guys gathered around the gates, and the tanks came in, and a tank comes through the uh, gate, breaks the gate down, and British GI standing on the front of the tank telling us what to do, and we're going to get you out of here and in three days if we can. Just stay put. Don't get don't get in our way. That's basically what I said. Uh -huh. And again, it was not until about ten years ago that I knew that that was Montgomery. Is that right? It was Montgomery. Wow. He was he was leading the charge. Huh. <laughs> that, uh,